So today we're going to go over the, uh, our topic is basic uh, moist air analysis. This is kind of a starting point is how do we describe the air that we're going to condition. And uh, as you can tell from my notes, uh, this is probably more complicated than you were thinking that it would be. There's a lot of thermodynamics here. And so if you were shaky uh, on thermo or some of the general chemistry, because we didn't use partial pressure a lot and mole fraction, and the ideal gas equation is constantly, we're, we're using that. Um, I probably want to brush up, but uh, hopefully you'll be uh, up to speed because we'll be using uh, basic uh, thermo a lot uh, in, the, in the early going here. Uh, and then once we pass through this phase of uh, analyzing air and the thermodynamics behind conditioning it, then we get to the heat transfer part where we look at how we assess the heating and cooling loads uh, that are um, causing us the problems that, for which we have to design the air conditioning system. And then after that, we look at how we move the air around. Once we condition it and you know, heat it or cool it, how do we get it from the source of the heating and cooling to the, where the people are? And that's where we get into the fluid mechanics part. And uh, so what I tried to do with the introductory notes last time, which is really review, it's not material that gets it's covered up on, on the, it's, it's just, it's foundational material for this class. And some of it, like the fluid mechanics part, um, I'll, I'll go over in, in some detail when we get to that part of the, of the class. Um, did you try the, the problems, the practice, or review? How, how, how were they? Did you? Uh, I'll, I'll post solutions. I haven't had time yet because I'm, I'm still just trying to get my classes uh, up and running, but I'll um, probably before the weekend post solutions so you can see how you did um, get the answers here. The answers. The first one, the enthalpy uh, closed tank contains a saturated mixture of water. And th this is using the uh, you know, we could do this with our thermodynamics tables from our, our thermo class, but um, I, I wrote this to, to make use of the, uh, of the water table as it appears in HVAC reference methods. So that first one here, closed tank at, at uh, 1.009 psi, saturated mixture of water and water vapor, um, and, and we're given the density of the mixture. What is the enthalpy? And uh, so the first thing we want to do is find the pressure. And in, in HVAC, we we use temperature, a temperature table rather than a pressure table because usually the pressure is uh, atmospheric pressure um, or, or, or close enough to it that we can just use the uh, atmospheric table. So we look for 1.09. So here's the temperature here on the left side. And then the pressure, the saturation pressure that corresponds to that temperature. And if we go down to Look for 1.009. There it is right there. So you can see that this water, this is the state, um, 102 or at 102 degrees, this water saturated at 1.009 uh, psi, and um, we're given the density as 0 0.008. What do we need to do to move forward? Density 0.8 pound mass per cubic feet. Yes? You'd solve for the specific volume. Right. And what is the specific volume? Uh, 1 over rho. 1 over rho. And what does that give us? Uh, 125. So 125 cubic feet per pound mass. And that's for the mix, right? So then we come over and we look for specific volume of the pure vapor and the pure liquid. So we have to go to this, these columns here. And for each of the of the, of the significant properties, um, specific volume, enthalpy, heat capacity, and uh, entropy. We're not going to be bothering with entropy uh, 
in this class, but um, really it's mainly inbound people who are using, who are doing air conditioning work. Um, okay, so um, you see we've got the uh, saturated solid and the saturated vapor. Now saturated solid, this, this is only good up to 32 degrees, and then at 32 degrees there's a phase transition. Uh, we move to uh, a liquid, and you'll notice that there's a break in the number. If you, you follow the number, and I don't have that page here, so let me see. Maybe you can see it. Um, I don't have the whole table here, but if you go to 32 degrees, you'll see that there's a there's a, there's a change that uh, from 31 to 32 or 32 to 33 in this number because of that phase change. But the column will still continue to read saturated solid, even if it's saturated liquid. Um, above 32 degrees, this column will be saturated liquid. And the little subscript I is uh, refers to solid. Uh, F would be liquid. Um, and then G, of course, is in this vapor. So we would come down here. Uh, we, uh, so we've got the, this is going to be our liquid phase and our vapor phase, right, to 1.009. Where'd it go? Right there. 1. Point, uh, right there. So 102 degrees. And we see that for the liquid, the specific volume point zero one six one four, and for the vapor, it's three thirty point six five. And this is cubic feet per pound mass. And what we're looking for here is the quality, right? Because uh, we're asked for the enthalpy. And the enthalpy of a, of a saturated mixture is uh, the enthalpy of the pure liquid plus the quality times the enthalpy of the latent change. HFG represents the energy required to vaporize the liquid to, to, uh, from a, turn it from a liquid to a, a vapor. Uh, some tables have a column with the FG term in it. This one doesn't. Um, and so we have to calculate it out as HF plus quality HG minus HF. Okay, H FG is HG minus HF at this temperature. Okay, and we get this from the table, but we, have, we don't know X. We have to get X from a known property, and that known property in this case is the specific volume. So how do we get that? Uh, well, we have volume is uh, a VF plus X, VG minus VF, so we have to solve for X. And the specific volume is the inverse of the uh, reciprocal of the density. Uh, so we found it to be 125 minus VF, which is really small, 0 0.01 divided by VG. And what, what did you get for that? 0.378. And, and then the, the enthalpy, therefore, is HF. So we have to come over here and look for HF. <coughs> so specific enthalpy, solid slash liquid, and then big, so HF is going to be over here. We have to come down to 102. Seventy point oh three three.
and then HG minus HF, so HG is going to be next to it, 1105.6 minus 70.033, and that will give us, what would you get for that? Uh, 461.48. 461.48. I'm going to trust that you're correct. <laughs> and that's BTA per pound mass, right? So that's just a, you know, calculating the, uh, using the saturation table when we have a saturated mixture. You know, we're, going to, we're going to run into this with refrigeration, of course, because in a refrigeration cycle, uh, there's always some place where the refrigerant is a saturated mixture. Um, the other ones, uh, the other problems are a little more complicated, and I'm going to hold off. I'm going to just put solutions to those when I can. Um, tons of cooling. Some of these we actually may do again as part of the class. But uh, number number two, the uh, the answer is 11 tons. And number three, H1 is 122, H2 is about 25, and then H3 equals H2 because we're going through a throttling process from two to three. That's constant enthalpy. So 25 in the units uh, ETU per, per pound mass. This is something we're, we're actually going to do in a few classes, so I'm, I'm not even going to skip to this, uh, really, because we're going to be talking about it. Um, th this was really not so much of a review as it was uh, presenting something new, because we did not use the pH diagram, I don't think, when we took thermo. I, I, have, I use it in some vari variations, but I don't think I did um, when you took it. I think it was more conceptual, right? Yeah, well, we used the table, the property table. I don't know why I cannot find the, uh, let me see if I can get it. Yeah. But we use these a lot in each fact work, more so actually than we use uh, tables because it's easy to represent the process, the refrigeration process. Uh, on a phase diagram where pressure is on the vertical and enthalpy is on the horizontal. And you'll notice the familiar, you know, the vapor dome here, saturated liquid line, saturated vapor line. And um, generally what we do here is um, we fix the, 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 the state of the refrigerant coming out of the evaporator. And out of the evaporator, it's a saturated vapor. It's a saturated vapor. Actually, it's in a real refrigeration cycle, it's usually a little bit superheated. But in an ideal cycle, it's saturated and it's at a low temperature. So it might be at minus 20. This is R134A. If the temperature is minus 20 and it's a saturated vapor, we would look for minus 20 degrees. And then we go to the saturation curve, and our point would be right there. That would be our state coming out of the evaporator. Now, where do we go from the evaporator? What's the next piece of equipment? Compressor. Compressor. So what does a compressor do? It's going to increase the pressure. Increases the pressure. The pressure is on the vertical axis. So is my process line going to go, which direction will it go? It's going to go up, right? It's going to go up. Is it going to go straight up vertically? No, it's not going to go straight up vertically. If you think about the ideal vapor compression cycle. What is the compressor in the ideal cycle? What is special about the ideal compressor? Isentropic. Isentropic. And what does isentropic mean? 100% efficiency. Constant entropy. Constant entropy. So what we would do is we would look for a, a, an entropy line, and that's what these, these lines here are constant entropy lines. This is why this is really convenient and easy to use, because you don't have to do interpolation like you do using tables. So what you do is, if you're right there, and you want to do an ideal compression, an isentropic compression is you go straight up, but you, you go parallel to a line of constant entropy. 
So you go up at an angle like this, a constant entropy, and you would stop at the desired pressure. So if I wanted to go to 200 PSI, I'd go right there. 200 PSI, I would stop uh, right here. And then I could see my temperature. See, the temperature lines are horizontal, but then they curve down. So I'd have to see what my temperature is. It looks like I'm, I'm right, I'm gonna be, well, I'm gonna be between 140 and 160 degrees. I'd have to, you have to use a ruler, put this on a table. I like to get really big, you know, 11 by 16, so I can see things clearly. And then I can, uh, I can, I can lay my, my point for my isentropic compressor. And then what I can do is I can use the isentropic efficiency of the compressor to figure out where I really am. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm at 200 PSI between 140 and 160, let's say I'm right there, where is the, where is the point for the real compressor, compressor gonna be in relation to this one? Which direction would I move? Further to the right. Further to the right, good, good. I still want to be at 200 PSI. My compressor design, I need 200 PSI coming out. Entropy generation creates what? Heat. Heat. Heat's going to raise the temperature of the refrigerant and it's going to push my, my state point to the right. And I'm going to come out of my real compressor at 200 PSI, but I'm going to add entropy, which is going to be a rightward move. That's going to make it hotter, so I'm going to come out maybe at 180 or 190 or something like that and I'm gonna be over here somewhere, okay? Then what comes after the compressor? Should be throttling. The, not the throttling, condense. We condense. Condensing is what kind of process? Isobaric. Constant, huh? Isobaric. Isobaric, constant pressure. So when I go to my condenser, I'm gonna to move to the right because I'm at constant pressure and first I'm gonna de-superheat. So I'm gonna go from a superheated vapor, I'm gonna hit the saturation curve here, and then I'm gonna condense at constant pressure all the way over until I'm gonna saturate liquid over here. And actually in a real refrigerator, it's gonna be subcooled a little bit. So I'm gonna come over here and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna subcool um, Which means I'm going to go a little bit to the left of the curve and be out, be out here somewhere. And, uh, and that's my, what my condenser does. And every, at every point, I can go up to the top or the bottom and read off the end valve. And it's, a, it's rough. You, know, you, you can only be so exact reading off these scales here. But it's good enough for the design, kind of design we do in, in HVAC. It's generally good enough. And then, after the condenser is what? Throttling. Throttling. And throttling is? It's isenthalpic. Constant enthalpy. So what direction would I move? You'd go down. I would go down. Straight down. Constant enthalpy. And this is nice because you can visualize what's happening to the refrigerant. You can see if I go straight down, what's going to happen to the refrigerant? How does the phase change? It becomes a mixture, a saturated mixture. And I can actually read the quality by looking at these lines here. And in a well-designed refrigeration cycle, I, I want to get my quality around 0.3, or maybe 0.25 to 0.35, because I, I, I need, it would, be, it would be great if it was all liquid, because I, I, what, what the, the, the cooling comes from vaporizing the liquid. So the more liquid I have to vaporize, the greater cooling capacity I have. You know, if I, so if I came out over here somewhere, I wouldn't have much refrigeration capacity. You know, I'd only be moving a short distance until I have vapor. Um, so you want to be as far left as you can. But we're going to uh, work with this diagram, and uh, we'll get to the refrigeration part. So you'll, you'll have some ability to learn about this. And, and we'll mess around with uh, refrigeration again. All right. Um, so these values were taken by reading off of the graph. And so people are, you know, there's going to be a little bit of a difference because um, we're eyeballing. And then number four, number four is a little bit more of a, a, bit, a bigger problem, right? It's hair dryer. Anybody get an answer? 
the electric power input to the dryer? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's right, but it's negative uh, two point, approximately okay. two point two seven. Yeah, that's right. That's exact. It's so, the same thing okay. that I got. Yeah, um, negative because we're putting work work is going into the dryer. Um, but if you if you just if if, if you said oh the, the, the Power is negative 2.27 kilowatts. That's fine. You could also say just it's 2.27 kilowatts into the dryer without using the negative sign. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask about this in general. So the power in that would be that's almost 2,300 watts, correct? Yes. Okay, which seems reasonable because normally, like what a, a general hair dryer is close to like 2,000. If I remember right, 1,800. 2000 somewhere. God, it's been so long since yeah. I use a hair dryer. I thought they were more like 1000. Um, 2000. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I was looking at this thing, 2.27 kilowatts. I'm going to probably blow a fuse in my household. It does seem like a decent amount. It's a lot. Yeah. Uh, 1 point volt, 20 amp. That's a yeah. lot of amperage. I mean, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty big. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is a realistic. I think that I would expect it to be more like a one kilowatt or one point two kilowatts. Right. Uh, yeah, one one point two. So long since I used good little devices to learn some basic thermo. Though it might be nice to bring them and take them apart and kind of look at them. There's a I, I know a guy who does uh, teaches thermo by having all the students buy a coffee maker of the class and they take the coffee apart and they learn thermodynamics by learning how your coffee is made. Now, that's pretty cool. Um, I'd love to do that. I, 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 haven't, I don't feel comfortable asking students to buy a, a coffee maker that they could then destroy in class. <laughs> Maybe I'll try it sometime and see. But I guess that you can get cheap coffee makers for 20, 30 bucks. No, that's, that's a lot when you're a student. Cheaper than a book. Cheaper than a book, yeah. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. God, when I was a student, man, I, I went to college on a, a, a program that doesn't even exist anymore, but it was for, for people that literally had nothing. I mean, you, you didn't have any money at all. So almost all my college was paid for by a federal grant. Um, but it ran out. It, it phased down in my senior year. And... Um, I took out a, a, some loans, a very small amount of loans. I mean, I paid, paid them off very quickly. Back then, it's nothing like today. Uh, this college was a lot cheaper, and there was a lot more financial aid that had no strings attached, especially if you were poor, and especially if you were dirt poor. Um, so I had all this, this financial aid, but then I ran out my senior year, and I literally didn't have money to eat, eat on. I went to my friend's house, and they fed me. I remember it was like a month where... I went to a buddy who had already, actually he didn't go to college, he was working, and um, I got to eat my meals with him. But, so I, I know what it's like to have to skimp on um, trying to make ends meet. Books were still really expensive, even though they were cheaper then than now, they were still expensive relative to everything else. And so we complained about probably as much then as students do now, except then we had no choice. There was no internet, no way to get, you know, to find PDFs or things like that. Okay. You know, my dad died when I was a senior in high school. Man, he, my dad died suddenly and left us with nothing. My mom didn't work, and then she, had a, she started to work. She didn't even drive a car, and she had to learn how to drive. Uh, and then as, as soon as she started driving, she wrecked it. She had a, a really bad accident, and, uh, and we had to deal with that. And my senior year of high school was a real challenge. But I grew up pretty fast. Um, and uh, it's always, I, I really appreciate when, you know, and, and, and have a special place in my heart for students that are struggling like that. Anyway, um, okay, so what we want to do now is get into um, Notes two. This is really where the course begins, and it begins with uh, something you probably look will look familiar because I do go over this in the thermo class. At the very end, we look at gas mixtures 
Uh, but as part of the notes on combustion, um, is we learn how to uh, take a mixture of uh, you know, you, a gaseous fuel. You know, it may have a mixture of several fuels, but I think in thermo we look at the combustion products. When you burn fuel in air, you get carbon dioxide and water vapor, and maybe some other stuff. You get nitrogen, and uh, and that those combustion products are analyzed as you know an ideal gas mixture. So, so we introduce these methods of you know, how do you calculate the mass fraction of a mixture, the mole fraction of a mixture, and that's what this first part is. And um, so calculate the mole fraction, uh, number of moles, you just sum the, the moles of each of the components. The moles is the mass divided by the, the molar mass. You sum them up. The mole fraction, you take one component and divide by the total number of moles. That's your mole fraction. That sums to one. And then example one is just a, an example. This is the same example I use in thermo, but I change the units to English units. I think other than that, it's the same. Um, and then we look at volume and pressure of gas mixtures. Again, this comes out of the thermo lectures. Uh, if, if we have a, a mixture of gases, um, the, the total pressure of the gas is equal to the sum of the pressure contributed by each gas. So you can think of each, each gas as contributing a little piece of the total pressure in a, in a space um, at the, the temperature and the volume of the mixture. So this little pi is the partial pressure. Dalton's law is the law that says that the total pressure, for example, if th this room consists of dry air and water vapor, pressure is 14.7 psi plus or minus a little bit. What it means is that that total 14.7 is made up of some pressure contributed by the dry air and some pressure contributed by the water vapor. The water vapor contribution is very tiny in, in that case because water vapor is a small part of the atmosphere. Uh, but that pi, the partial pressure, uh, you can calculate as the product of the mole fraction and the total pressure. So the, mold, the partial pressure of air, or the par partial pressure of water vapor in the air would be the mole fraction of the water vapor times 14.7, the total pressure. And uh, we can also calculate it using the ideal gas equation. It's a little more complicated in that case. The P is MRT over V. And we would use our specific gas constant for the component. Um, then an example here that um, shows how we can calculate the partial pressure. And um, so this is general background, right, for now moving into looking at air. Um, or what we call moist air. Moist air is the, uh, a combination of dry air and water vapor. And that's really what we're, that's the subject of our air conditioning and heating processes. Uh, so properties of, of ideal gas mixtures, we want to be able to determine the enthalpy and specific volume and things like that of a mixture of gas. Um, and the way we do that is we just take a weighted sum. Uh, so if you have a mix, you have, you have a air is, let's say you've got a gas, it's 50% water vapor and 50% dry air. The enthalpy would be whatever the enthalpy of the, it will be 0.5 times the enthalpy of the dry air plus 0.5 times the enthalpy of the water vapor. Just uh, a mass weighted sum. Um, and, and we can do that, we can apply that to any property uh, of, of interest. Specific heat, molar specific heat, but here we, we would do a mole, molar weighted sum using the mole fraction, whereas with the mass weight, we use the mass fraction. And we want, to, we want to take this and use it to determine the enthalpy of air, of moist air. The enthalpy is very important. That's what we're changing. We're changing the enthalpy of the air in the air condition or heat. So finding what that enthalpy is is, is very, very important. 
Um, yeah, so now we go from the general case of ideal gas mixtures to moist air. Atmospheric air, we also call it moist air, a mixture of dry air and water vapor. And if we apply Dalton's law, it says that the pressure of the air pressure is the sum of the contribution from the air. And I really should put a little D in front of that because it's really the dry air. And actually going forward, I'll use DA to make clear that we're talking about the dry air part, just the dry air, not including the water. And then the partial pressure of the water vapor is that number there. So the sum would add up to 14.7 if the pressure is 14.7 PSI. Uh, and then we can calculate the pressures of the dry air, partial pressure of the water vapor, if we know the mole fractions, which can be found if we know the moles, the molar composition of the air. Okay, now the enthalpy, the enthalpy of the air we would calculate as a weighted sum of the enthalpy of the water and the dry air. So this is how we reach the line we had up there. The enthalpy of our mixed air, our mixture of water vapor and dry air would be the mass fraction of the dry air times the enthalpy of the dry air plus the mass fraction of the water vapor and the specific enthalpy of the water. Of course, these are going to depend on the temperature. Okay. However, and this is very, very important, this is not how we define properties or how we use the properties in HVAC. It might seem sensible to do it this way. Yeah, I want BTU per pound of total air, or I want the specific volume, cubic feet per pound mass of total air. But we don't do it that way. It would actually be a lot harder to do calculations if we did it like this. Instead, the convention is to express the properties of moist air not in terms of the mass of the mixture, but in terms of the mass of the dry air only. The dry air only. So instead of BTU per pound mass of mix, the mix, we want BTU per pound mass of dry air in the mixture. Now, how do you get that? You get that by dividing this equation by the mass fraction of dry air, so the mass fraction of A, DA. So if we take this and divide through by MFA, like this, we would get the HA by itself plus the mass fraction of water vapor divided by the mass fraction of the dry air times the enthalpy of the water. And that ratio right there is a very important number in thermodynamics and in air conditioning. This is called the humidity ratio. On well, the specific humidity, it has the variable name W, and it is related to relative humidity, a term we use every day when we're talking about weather. Um, so we would rewrite and we would express properties of moist air in this form here. We replace mass of the water vapor over the mass of the dry air. We replace it with W. And then this is our equation for the enthalpy of moist air. Now notice I don't have the M here anymore. Right? It just stands by itself. This is the enthalpy of moist air in units of BTU per pound mass of dry air. Okay. And we would do the same thing for the other properties of inference, specific volume, uh, the entropy, if we were, if we were doing uh, interested in entropy. But it's really enthalpy that we mainly apply this, uh, this method. Um, OK, so properties of moist air, we usually look them up in tables or charts. We, don't often calculate it this way because there are other easier ways of finding the, the, the properties of the, of the air. Um, let's see. Um, some of these calculations are a pain in the neck. 
uh, which is why we have a psychometric chart because then it gets rid of all the calculation. So we're going to uh, toward the end of the psychometric chart. But we can calculate specific volume using this equation here, the ideal gas equation, where R is for the dry air, temperature over the total pressure minus the pressure of the water. We take out the water from the denominator, and this puts it in the form cubic feet per pound mass of dry air. Okay. Now, how do we then find these pieces? If this is the enthalpy of the air, we see we've got HA, enthalpy of dry air, and enthalpy of the water vapor. So how do we get those? How do we know what those are? Well, we have to come down here, and we split the air into dry air and water vapor. Okay? Now, for dry air, we can calculate the enthalpy as the product of specific heat and temperature. Okay, and we can get away with this with uh, an HVAC because the temperature range is not so great. Yeah. A few tens of degrees to maybe 100 degrees max, usually 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees. And so the, the specific heat of dry air is not going to change very much. Even though it is temperature dependent, it's going to be around 0.24, maybe 0.41, 0.242, 0.239, but 0.24, fine for our, our purposes, specific heat of dry air. And then we just multiply it by whatever the temperature is, the, dry, the temperature of the air, and that's our HA, okay? Now, what about the water component? That is more difficult, a little more complicated here. Now, why would that be? With air, air doesn't change phase. Dry air stays as a vapor, right? So uh, we don't have any situations and we don't worry about condensing air. Gaseous dry air isn't going to become liquid dry air. Um, and, and so we can simply, we can express the specific heat simply in terms of sensible heating. That is heating where that only affects the, uh, where we only change temperature, we don't change phase. Water is a different story. It's complicated by the fact that the that water vapor can change phase as temperature goes up and down. Water will condense out. The water will vaporize into the air. And so the thermal energy, we have two components of the thermal energy of water vapor. One is, comes from the, uh, the saturated uh, water vapor component. This would be the energy required to vaporize, to turn liquid water into water vapor, so to, to vaporize the, the, the water into, so it becomes water vapor. And uh, this is ten, uh, 1,061 BTU per pound mass is the standard that's used in HVAC. This is the energy required to turn one pound of liquid water into water vapor, okay? So the enthalpy of the water vapor in the air is the sum of 1061 plus the sensible component, which in the sensible component is the same as with air. Once we've turned liquid into vapor, now we can warm it. We can change the temperature sensibly without changing the phase. And that's what this component is. So the enthalpy of the water is the energy required to vaporize it plus whatever beyond that, if, if, if the temperature is higher than the vaporization temperature, we add this increment of energy. And 0.444 is the specific heat of water vapor, okay, times the temperature. Okay? Now, you might think that, cool, I can calculate my the enthalpy contribution of the dry air, the enthalpy contribution of the water vapor, just add them up and we're done. But we can't. You see why? The units here, BTE per pound mass of dry air, 
and the units here are BTU per pound mass of water. So we can't have them. They're not the same units. We've got to converse to the same mass basis. Okay? And we do that by We can do that by, we, we, we can actually convert the water component to a, on, onto a dry air basis by multiplying by the humidity ratio W. So you multiply W by HW, you'll see, let's see if we can show what that is. So um, W is in units of pounds of water per pound of dry air. That's the humidity ratio. If we multiply that by the enthalpy of the water, which is BTU per pound of water, we get BTU per pound of dry air. And now we can add. We can add the enthalpy of the water to the enthalpy of the air. Um, and we end up with the enthalpy of moist air expressed by equation 22. And this is a little typo I saw this morning. Uh, this should be 20, equation 22. This is an important equation because it allows us to calculate the enthalpy of the air, the moist air, if we don't have a table or a psychometric chart. We still have to know what the humidity ratio is. But we just need to know the humidity ratio and the temperature and we can calculate the enthalpy. Okay. Okay, now we need to talk about air at saturation, when air is saturated with water vapor. What that means is that when air is saturated, if we cool the air, if we remove an increment of energy from the air to cool it, we will immediately condense water out. That air is holding as much water vapor as it possibly can. And we cool it a tiny bit more than water would come out as rain, if it's atmospheric air as rain or dew, is another way that uh, uh, liquid water comes out of the air. And uh, so if we look at our phase diagram here um, for water, generally, you know, air, air, the water in air is superheated vapor. Okay? So the, the property of the uh, water would be out here. It would be superheated vapor at you know, low pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure. And uh, this would be the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air. What I called PW before, but it's a partial pressure. Now, if we increase the pressure, holding the temperature constant, at some point, we'll reach the saturation curve and we'll start condensing start condensing air out. But also, we can condense air the other way. And this is how it happens in nature, is nighttime happens, and the temperature drops, but the pressure stays constant. The air, air pressure is not varying very much, so the partial pressure of the water vapor is staying constant, but we're cooling, and eventually we reach the saturation curve, and then if we try to cool a little bit, look what happens, water, water droplets. Okay. So a key point here is when the partial pressure of water vapor is equal to the saturation pressure, we have saturated air. We have saturated air. In any other state beyond that is the air, the water in the air is superheated vapor, and where the partial pressure is less than the saturation pressure. Okay. Now we can define the Humidity ratio, we already defined it as the mass of the water in the air to the mass of dry air. OK? 
okay? Now, it's usually inconvenient to calculate mass of water, the mass of water, mass of dry air. We can create a more convenient expression by using the ideal gas equation, where m equals PV over RT, where we use the water properties in the numerator and dry air in the denominator, and this simplifies into the, ma the molar mass of water times the partial pressure of water divided by molar mass of air, partial pressure of air. Well, we know the molar mass of water, molar mass of dry air. So you divide that through, we end up with this handy expression where the humidity ratio is equal to 0.622 times the ratio of the partial pressure of water vapor to the partial pressure of dry air. Well, it, we only have two components in the, in the air, water vapor and dry air, so we can uh, create another more commonly used expression where the pressure of the dry air is just the air pressure, which we can measure 14.7 or close to it, minus what the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air is. So this is a very handy equation for calculating the humidity ratio if we know what the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air is. Okay? Now, more common in our everyday language is relative humidity, but I bet you nobody knows what that term really means. Maybe 1% or less of the population knows the thermodynamic definition of relative humidity. It is the ratio of the actual partial pressure of the water vapor in the air to the saturation pressure at the air temperature. The saturation of the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air, that is what the actual partial pressure is, divided by what the pressure, the partial pressure would be at the saturation temperature. Okay? Another way of defining it using Dalton's law is it's the ratio of the mole fraction of water vapor in the air to the mole fraction of water vapor at the saturation temperature. Temperature. In other words, we would cool the air, we would cool the air down until we reach the saturation point, and whatever that pressure, that air partial pressure was at saturation, that would be the term that goes in the denominator. Okay? And then once we, uh, if we know one of these, humidity ratio, relative humidity, we can convert back and forth. We can express humidity ratio in terms of the relative humidity and relative humidity in terms of the humidity ratio. Okay? Yes? I did want to ask a question in terms yeah. of relative humidity. Uh, can you mathematically have it be higher than 100%? If it were no. To no, okay. Okay, thank you. And here's a, an example. Um, we have a warehouse, a million cubic feet of warehouse space. It's at 54 degrees, and the humidity ratio is 0 0.005 pound mass of water per pound mass of dry air. It's pretty small. It's not a lot of water vapor. But it, 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 thermodynamically, it, it's very significant. Okay, so we want to know what is the relative humidity. We we'll use equation 26b. Use the given humidity ratio as 0 0.005. We're at 14.7 psi, 0.622 plus W times the saturation pressure. Now, where do you get the saturation pressure? What is that? Okay, the saturation pressure is, well, it's the saturation pressure at the air temperature. What's the temperature? Temperature is 54 degrees. Okay, what's the saturation pressure? We have to pull out our saturation table. And what was the temperature, 54? 54 degrees, oh shoot, I only, uh, I only started it at 55, so I don't have the 54. But this will show 
where we get it. It's this column here. It's just it's a, it, it's the pressure in our thermodynamic table, or our saturation table. It's uh, the pressure. This pressure when the water is saturated and the temperature is 55 degrees, the pressure will be 0.21414 psi. Okay. So if we have air, if it's 55 degrees, that the water vapor in that air is going to be less, it, ha it has to be less than this, okay, in order to be this water vapor into air. But as soon as that pressure becomes 0.21414 psi, then we'll be on the saturated vapor curve. And we would have saturated air. And if we cool any below that, we're going to condense the water out. So anyway, the saturation pressure, we, we, we read it at the temperature of the air, which is 54 degrees. So it's going to be a little bit less than 0.21414. Let's see what it actually was here. 0.206. So this is table 2.1. In the book, and I've also posted these tables in full. So if you don't have the book, or you know you want to have the online access, so I'm posting all these tables um, at 54 degrees. We can read off the table the saturation pressure 0.20646. So I plug that in, and now I have my relative humidity. The relative humidity is 57 percent. Okay. You know, it's interesting to figure out, okay, well, how much water is actually in the air. Suppose I wanted to design a system that would condense out all that water. Maybe I have some sensitive equipment in that room, and it can't tolerate 57% relative humidity. How much water would I have to bring out of that air? Well, I can calculate that in the mass of water vapor. I can calculate it using the ideal gas equation. It's a little bit of a cumbersome calculation, but we can do it. Um, in this case, I'm using the uh, molar form of the ideal gas law, with moles of water, the universal gas constant, and T over the room volume. So we have to know the room volume. Moles is mass over molar mass, so I can replace N of water with M divided by molar mass. R, U, and T, and then solve this for the mass of water. Solve for the mass of water vapor, and we know all of these. The universal gas constant, molar mass of water, and the partial pressure of the water vapor we can find from the relative humidity. The definition of relative humidity is the partial pressure of the water vapor over the saturation pressure. We just found the saturation pressure, 0.20646, and we know our actual partial pressure must be less than that in order for the water to be superheated. And so we can solve this for the, sat the partial pressure of water vapor humidity times relative humidity times the saturation pressure, and we get 0.1172 psi. That's the actual partial pressure of water vapor in the air. Okay, so now I have all of my variables here. I've got everything needed. Just plug everything in and make sure units, the units work out, and they're pretty close. I just need to uh, pressure is in uh, pounds per square inch. So I need to get the inches out of there, convert to feet, and we find, wow! That's a lot of water, isn't it? 383 pounds of water <laughs> in that air. A uh, million square feet is a pretty big warehouse, but um, that amount of water is not insignificant in a big building. So you're going to have to have, if you want to control that humidity, 
you're going to have to design an air conditioning system that pulls out whatever amount of it, some fraction, whatever fraction is desired to make the room comfortable or to make it meet the needs of the equipment that's in there. That's 383 pounds of water. You've got to design the piping system. You've got to have the air conditioning system. That water's going to condense. You don't want it to fall on the floor or drop on the people in the space or ruin the equipment. So you've got to design a water flow system, a fluid flow system to move that water away. And actually, that's, that's, that's pure water. You can use that for drinking water. You can cover it in some way. You don't want to throw it out. I've got this little pump, this electric pump that switches on when my home air conditioner up. When its water tank fills up, and it's condensing water out, I hear it switch on. And uh, it's just dumping the water outside. I can't do that. That's good, clean water. Maybe a project for the summer. Anyway, yeah, so um, a, lot, a lot here in the notes. And the, you know, I designed the homework. The first homework is based solely off of these. So I think you should be able to do that homework just off of the notes, too. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's take a little break, and we'll come back, and, uh, and I've got some examples, uh, some other examples I want to do with you uh, as we work toward the end of the notes here. I handed out some, uh, just some, some example problems to go over, and um, but before I get to those, I want to just introduce, throw out a couple more concepts that are, that are really important that we're going to be talking about. Okay, one is temperature. Um, there are several temperatures. Well, there's three temperatures that an HVAC will need to be concerned about. Uh, the first is the ordinary temperature of the air. We call that the dry bulb temperature, or just T. If you see a variable T, it just means ordinary temperature measured with an ordinary thermometer. Um, there is a second temperature called the wet bulb temperature. You ever heard of wet bulb temperature? Yeah, it's, I, I remember, gosh, I, elementary or junior high school or something, but you know, we had these things called a sling psychrometer that was a thermometer on a, like the end of a stick, and it would, it would turn around. You could move it, you could whip it through the air really fast. And uh, what, it's, a, it's a regular thermometer that has a little cotton wick attached to the bowl, and that cotton wick is, is moist. It's dipped in water. So you've got this wet cotton wick on the thermometer bowl. And then what you do is you, you, you just move that thermometer bulb through the air for some period of time until the temperature comes to equilibrium. And that temperature will, of course, be less than the regular dry bulb temperature because you've got water on the end. But do you know what you're doing? What, what's actually happening when you're moving that psychrometer through the air? What's happening to the water on that cotton? It's evaporating. You're causing evaporation to happen. What is going to happen to the air that's around that thermometer bulb? When the, while the water is evaporating, what's going to happen to the air temperature just in the vicinity of the thermometer bulb? Is it going to rise or fall? It's going to fall, right? Now think about it. You're whipping this thing around, and the water is evaporating. What, what is required to cause water to change from liquid to vapor? Temperature. Energy. Where's that energy coming from? It's actually coming from the air. It's coming from the air around that, the water. It's coming from the water itself to some degree. Well, not from the water itself, but it's, it, it's coming from the air. Um, it actually is, is coming a little bit from the liquid that remains in the, uh, on the wick. Um, but the net effect of that is to cause the temperature to fall. And as you keep whip, uh, 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 spinning it around, eventually, evaporation will cease when the air is no longer capable of absorbing moisture. That is, when the air becomes saturated. 
it will no longer be able to absorb vapor from that wick, and the temperature will equilibrate at what is called the wet bulb temperature, the wet bulb temperature, okay? The lower the wet bulb temperature, the drier the air, okay? The, lo the, the drier the air, the more you can evaporate, the more water will evaporate, and thus the lower the temperature will be on the thermometer. What do you think the temperature would be if the air was starting out, it was 100% saturated, it was saturated, 100% relative humidity. What do you think the wet bulb temperature would be? The same. The same as the dry bulb temperature. You'd be spinning that thing around in nothing, no evaporation, because the air is incapable. It's already saturated, it cannot absorb any water off that wick, and the temperature would not change. It would be the same as the dry bulb temperature. So we have, by definition, uh, the air is saturated, which also means the relative humidity is 100% when the dry bulb temperature equals the wet bulb temperature. So these things all happen when the air is saturated. The relative humidity is 100%, the wet bulb temperature equals the dry bulb temperature. But uh, in any other situation, the dry bulb temperature, uh, the wet bulb will be less than the dry bulb, and it can never be greater. It can be less than or equal. Nowadays, there's a uh, we can measure dry bulb temperature electronically. There's a little circuit, uh, and you're actually measuring capacitance. There's a little capacitor in here that the capacitance varies with the amount of moisture in the air and it's calibrated to give you a readout of the wet bulb temperature. So really handy little devices. Um, so the wet bulb temperature is an indication of how much moisture is in the air. We need, in order to do any analysis of the, of the air, we need to know two things about the air. We need to know two things. We need, and usually it's the dry bulb temperature because that's easy to measure with a little thermometer. And then we need to know something else. Wet bulb temperature, usually it's either the wet bulb temperature or the relative humidity. In some cases we might know the humidity ratio. Um, okay, so that's wet bulb temperature. And then another important temperature is the dew point temperature. Have you heard of dew point? Sometimes in weather reports they'll, they'll say, say what the dew point is or what the dew point is expected to be. And uh, well, the dew point is also a measure. Well, the dew point, the dew point tells you at what temperature condensation would begin. Okay, so uh, I don't know if my weather app gives the current dew point temperature. Let's see. Um, the humidity right now is eighty percent. Oh, the dew point is 43. Dew point is 43 degrees. The dry bulb temperature is 49. So if this air were to cool, if we cooled it, if we started to air condition this air in here, well, the air's not 49 degrees, if we, if we were to condition the outdoor air and cool it from 49, when we hit 43, water would start to come out. We would be at the dew point, okay? So the dew point, if you go to our phase diagram, this will be ordinary air where superheated water vapor in the air here. And um, we're at, this is the air temperature. And this is the partial pressure of the water vapor in the air. Now, if we cool the air at constant pressure, so and, and the constant vapor pressure, and it would be constant if we don't change it, if we don't add water or take water out. This is going to be constant. So if you cool it down, like what, what happened at night, you know, as we go in the evening, the air, dry bulb temperature falls, and eventually we hit the saturation curve, and the temperature that corresponds to that hitting the saturation curve, that's the dew point temperature. Okay? Very important in air conditioning because we often design our systems to target the dew point temperature of the given air. And actually, any, just about any air conditioning cooling system is going to 
when it starts to cool, it's going to be moving the air toward the dew point. And well, we'll, we'll talk about that later, how that works. Um, but anyway, so it saturated, uh, when we have saturated air, all of these temperatures are equal. The dew point temperature will equal the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperature. If the air is saturated, then any cooling is going to cause condensation immediately. We want to be able to drop the temperature. So the temperature is 100, we have 100% relative humidity. The dew point temperature will be the same as the air temperature. Yes, sir? Uh, well, I was going to ask if there's any like, maximum temperature for the dew point, or like, if it could be like you know, 100 degrees or something like that. Well, no, the maximum would be the dry bulb temperature. Yeah. 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 Um, OK. So. Um, and then, you know, if the air is not saturated, it's just like ordinary air, then uh, this is the, uh, the, the, dry, uh, do, the dry bulb temperature will be less than the wet bulb temperature, which will be, uh, wait a minute, this is dew point. So another little mistake, that should be the dew point temperature, less than the wet bulb, less than the dry bulb. Some sources use a subscript dB for dry bulb, and I have notes for different textbooks, and I've got to really be careful to be consistent, but just T by itself is dry bulb, okay? Now, there's another set of tables that we sometimes use um, when we're analyzing moist air, and this would be table 2.5 in our, in our textbook. Let's take a look at that. This is a these are, this is thermodynamic properties of moist air when it's saturated. It's a saturated moist air. When the air is, the relative humidity is 100%. That's what this data is for. Okay? And it also includes the property for dry air at the temperature. So there'll be data for saturated air and then for completely dry air at 14.7 PSI. So for example, <clears throat> at 45 degrees dry bulb, if the air is saturated with 100% relative humidity, this would be the humidity ratio here. And then the specific volume would be this, the specific enthalpy, this, specific heat capacity, and so on. So the subscript S means saturated. And then if the air were bone dry, pure air, no water at all, then the property would be the DA, dry air property. So you see enthalpy. Look at the difference. Dry air at 45 degrees has an enthalpy of 10.8. You add a teeny, tiny, tiny bit of water vapor, a teeny, tiny bit of water vapor, and look at the change in the enthalpy from 10.8 to 17.7. That's why 100% humidity feels really bad. The that air has a lot more energy, and of course, the air conditioner is going to have to work to move that, remove that energy. Okay. And uh, so this can be a handy table. Um, it's another way that we can calculate properties of moist air. Okay? And I show you how to do that here. If, for example, we want to know what is the enthalpy, given uh, if I know what the humidity ratio W is of my air, I can come to this table and I can calculate specific volume and enthalpy. Okay, so uh, enthalpy of the dry, so let's say it's at 45 degrees, and I want to know the enthalpy, I go and get the dry air enthalpy is 10.808, and then whatever my humidity ratio happens to be goes here, the saturation humidity ratio, WS, would be this number, and then HS minus HDA. And that's another way of calculating the enthalpy. And in the next example, I use both methods. I can't calculate the enthalpy. Here we have air at 
45 degrees, and the humidity is 45%. So you want to calculate the specific enthalpy um, and uh, using the moist air table and the equation presented earlier. Okay. To use the moist air table, we have to know the humidity ratio. And we can calculate that because we know the relative humidity is 45%, so 0.45. PSAT, PSAT we get by going to our water table. Looks like another little error there. It's 45 degrees, 0.14205. And uh, I am really disappointed that I don't have my uh, the air table at lower temperature. But let me just check that here to make sure that number is right. So 45 degrees. Saturation pressure at 45 degrees. 0.14757. Okay, so that is correct. This is right. That's that's not right. So the saturation pressure at 45 degrees is 0.14757. So I'm going to have to go and change that the errors here. Um, okay. And then the total pressure 14.7 minus relative humidity 0.45, and then saturation pressure we get 0.0045 pound, pounds of water per pound of dry air. So now you can go to the moist air table at 45 degrees and read off what the saturation humidity ratio is, the dry air enthalpy, and the saturated air enthalpy. And then we just plug those into this equation here. And we can get our enthalpy. It's 15.67. And then the next equation shows how, the, uh, how, how we can get the same result by using the specific heat version of the equation, where we have the specific heat, we have the contribution from dry air and the contribution from the water, and when we plug those numbers in, we get presto, we get the same number. Okay? Now all of this stuff, all these formulas and calculations and tables are a real pain. And, uh, we, we learn it at the beginning of our HVAC work, and sometimes we may have to do some calculations uh, off the cuff where we don't have charts and things like that. But by and large, all of this is greatly simplified by this psychometric chart, which I handed out to you. And you'll notice that it has a certain shape and a whole bunch of lines on it. And you'll notice, first of all, notice the horizontal axis is the dry bulb temperature. You'll see on the left the saturation line. This represents the saturation, the saturated vapor line. So everything to the right here is superheated, the air, the air has superheated water in it. But all the points along this line represent saturated air where the humidity would be 100% when you're on that line there. On the vertical is the humidity ratio. And then you'll see these curved lines here. They're uh, lines from upper right to lower left, relative humidity. There are lines of, for specific volume, and then lines for the enthalpy. 
and the enthalpy scale will be off over here. And the numbers are also written on the axes here, which allow you to draw a line connecting the enthalpy scale up here to the enthalpy scale down here, and it helps you to align um, to make sure you're 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 you're, you're aligning the your your line properly. I find it the most difficult property to get off the chart to me is enthalpy because of the way it's positioned in an awkward way and the line is diagonal. So for example, uh, temperature of 70 degrees dry bulb, um, if the humidity were 100%, we would, we would go up, we'd follow the 70 degree line up until we hit the saturation curve. That would be 70 degrees, 100% relevant humidity. And then we can read over to the vertical to see what the humidity ratio is. And you'll also see that the dew point temperature, there's, a, there's another little temperature scale here, which is a scale for wet bowl and dew point temperature. You can see that it's going to be 70, 70, 70. Wet bulb temperature 70, but a dew point temperature 70. And we could read the enthalpy as well. Um, and uh, there's a little video here. You can go to it and it will show you how to use the psychometric chart and go through an example with you if you want to uh, you know, have some reinforcement after class. I think there's some links to some other videos as well. And one of the nice things about the chart is you not only can find the properties of air at a, at, for a given point, you can map out an air conditioning process. So let's say you want to, uh, your, 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 air prop, your air state is right here, and let's say you want to cool the air, you can create a process that moves horizontally to the left, and that would be sensible cooling. You're, you're changing only the dry bulb, well, you're changing the dry bulb temperature, but not the moisture, not the water vapor in the air. You're only changing its temperature, so you go to the left. In heating, when we design heating systems, this is when you don't want to mess with the water vapor. You don't want to mess with the amount of water in the air. Heating is just the moving to the right. If you wanted to just mess with the water, but not the temperature, Humidification would be of moving vertically upward. Then your humidity ratio goes up. Temperature stays constant. Dehumidifying would be a downward move. So we can design processes to get to any desired uh, state from a, whatever your starting point is. And really, this is what HVAC is all about. Tell me what your what's your environment your environmental condition, where are you on the psychometric chart, and where do you want to be? Where are you, and where, you, where do you want to be, and I will design the process that will get you there. That's, that's our job, that's what we do. And a lot of the rest of the class is gonna be figuring out how we move around the chart, and what kinds of equipment do we need to get to enable us to do that, okay? And of course, often, you know, we don't want pure heating or pure humidifying, we want combinations, so we're going off in diagonal directions, and those can be challenging. Uh, but we'll be talking about most of these uh, processes, okay? Now, I wanna work uh, some examples here um, to show how we uh, apply the equations and how we use the chart. So if you shift your attention to the uh, Problem. Okay, I'm going to do problems three and, and four. These are these are the most important ones. Problem three, we're not going to use the psychometric chart, and problem four, we'll use the psychometric chart. So problem three, 
We've got atmospheric air at 90 degrees. stuff here. Uh, 90 degrees and the wet bowl is 55 degrees. And uh, we're at 14.7 psi. Okay, what is the relative humidity? What is the relative humidity? Go to equation 25. The relative humidity is the ratio of the partial pressure of the water vapor into air to the partial pressure of the water at saturation. So saturation is saturated at 90 degrees. sat at 90 degrees. We go to our cable of um, water cable. To 90 degrees. And we read off the pressure. That's the set that's the pressure, the saturation pressure of water at 90 degrees, 0.69899. I made, a, I made a little mistake here. Um, in this problem set up. So change. Use the wet bulb temperature uh, without the psychometric charge. There is a way I can work with the wet bulb temperature, but it's, it involves just really nasty algebra, and I, I don't want to do that because usually we just use the wet bulb temperature with the psychometric chart. So let's keep it with the, the dew point temperature here. What we have is a situation where um, Air is at 90 degrees. So it's going to be way up here. point is at 55.
So we get both of these off of the water table, 90 degrees. So we're at 90 degrees. If we wanted to, if we do a, a constant temperature increase in pressure, okay, our saturate, our pressure, our partial pressure of water vapor is point two one four one four. If we were to increase that pressure at constant temperature to 0.69899, we would start to condense water. Similarly, if we were to cool at constant pressure down to 55 degrees, we'll condense the water out at 0.21414 psi. That's what that's what I'm trying to trying to show there. Um, so the partial pressure of the water is the saturation pressure at 55 degrees F or So our relative humidity is going to be equal to 0.21414 divided by 0 0.69, 0 0.69899, which is 31%, 0 0.31 or 31%. So we're at 90 degrees, the dew point the dew point is 55. So our humidity is going to be this the, the saturation pressure at the actual temperature, which is 90 degrees. divided by the saturation pressure I'm sorry it's the saturation pressure at the dew point temperature which is 55 degrees divided by the saturation pressure at the actual temperature is the relative humidity and then the Absolute humidity, or the um, this is sometimes called the absolute humidity, or specific humidity, or humidity ratio is the more common term. I'll try to remember to use the uh, keep using the humidity ratio. This 0.622 partial pressure of the water vapor, P minus P W, 0.622. Zero zero nine two pounds of water per pound of dry air.
And then there is another unit that some sector metrics charts use for humidity ratio that is, um, uses the unit grain, grains of water over pounds of dry air. The train sector metric chart presents humidity ratio in grains of water per pound of dry air. And uh, grains is equal to 7,000 times W in pound of water, pound of dry air. So it would be 7,000 times 0 0.0092 equals 64 grains of water per pound of dry air. And grain is preferred by some people because it's a normal sized number. It goes from 0 to 100 or something like that. Whereas the uh, more conventional pounds of water, the number is very small. So you just have to deal with lots of zeros, it's a small number. Um, personally, in my own work, I like using the train chart um, because our text uses the ASHRAE chart, and I think that's more commonly used. Um, we'll, we'll mainly use the ASHRAE chart. But I may from time to time show some examples on the train chart. You can see different colors, different. Yeah. I wanted to ask a quick question about this. With mm -hmm. grains, is there a specified size that they're saying that a grain of air is to get to that conversion to say that a grain is a certain numerical value from having a certain amount of pounds yeah, it's, it's of interesting. air, if that makes sense? Yeah, I don't know what the origin is or what, where the 7,000 comes from or how it was invented. It's, it's like tons of refrigeration, I guess. It seems so. like it just... Well, at least tons of refrigeration has a, a physical meaning. It's you know how much energy to melt a block of you know one ton block of ice or the freeze of one ton block of ice. I don't know where grains comes from. It's just uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Weird, weird number. Um, okay, so uh, there's one more. We're looking for the specific volume. So using the moist air table for specific volume, with the specific volume of dry air plus W over WS, the specific volume saturated air minus the specific volume of the dry air. Okay, so for that we go to our chart, uh, our moisture properties. Let's see, this one here. Moist air at 90 degrees. We're looking for our humidity ratio at saturation. Point zero three one two zero oh six. So the humidity ratio at saturation, point zero, can I, in small numbers, just driving up the wall, zero three one two zero six pounds of water 
pounds of dry air. And then we can read off the specific volume of the saturated air. Saturation 0 0.03126 times BS 14.546 minus 13.854. And when all that nonsense is done, we get 14.06 cubic feet per pound of dry air, pound mass of dry air. Okay, so that's just calculating out some properties of moist air using the thermodynamic equations. And now we'll look at a better way. But it's a lot easier using the psychometric chart. Okay. Um, get rid of this. A grain is apparently the amount of water in one drop of water. Huh? A grain is apparently the amount of water in one drop of water. So oh, really? If you have water dripping down, it'll drip 7,000 times to make a pound. Cool. So 7,000 drops of water make a pound of water. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess that makes sense. Um, 7,000, yeah. Okay. Do a little test. Two really good measurement. Because a drop of water is not always the same size. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's a salt water. So I was going to say, You know, there's a whole yeah. subject of, drop, of, of droplet formation and physics of how drops form. Um, okay, well, the psychometric chart comes in various uh, varieties. You've got this one. It is uh, psychometric charts, the most commonly used one at sea level, so 14.7 psi. But it's important in engineering work that we use a table for the, uh, the, the pressure that we're, we're building in. And normally that, that, that pressure varies with altitude. So if we're working at, uh, in Denver, Colorado, for example, That's going to be a big difference. we want to use the psychometric chart at 5,000 feet. And all these properties are going to change. There's also a table at 7,500 feet. Those are the only ones I've ever worked with. 7,500, 5,000, and most of our work is done close enough to sea level that we can use the sea level chart. Uh, there's also uh, special charts for high temperature and low temperature. So we're going down in temperature to you know, zero degrees Fahrenheit or below, or really anything below 12 degrees Fahrenheit, we can uh, this, is, this is an extension of the ordinary chart to low temperatures. There's another one that goes to high temperatures. Yes, sir? If you were doing HVAC in a really, really tall building, would you have to use two different charts at two different levels? No, no. Okay. Oh, and then the train chart looks like this. Now notice the ASHRAE chart has this little compass here. And we use this when we're designing a, in, in our HVAC design. And we'll come to that a little bit later, what we do with that. But I find this cumbersome to work with. I much prefer the information that's all here on the train chart is presented on the vertical scale here. And for, or in the green here. It's actually much e easier for me to use this scale, but we can. Okay, um, so here's the chart, and if we look at the problem that is given, problem four, cold, clammy room is at 45 degrees. 
It's amazing how much easier this is with the psychometric chart. You just have to sit down with a straight edge and a magnet, some, sometimes using a magnifier, and, um, but it's a lot more convenient. So I want to I want to find the state. I want to fix the state of this room on the psychometric chart, starting with 45 degrees. This is on the horizontal, so I made the little vertical line at 45 degrees. And now I need one more property to fix the state, 80% relative humidity. So here's an 80% relative humidity curve. I see where they intersect, and that is my state one. That's the starting state of my room. Let me make it darker. Can you all see? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, let me see this a little better. Okay, so there is my starting point. Everything that I'm going to do to my space, I'm going to start from there. All right, I want to find the other properties that go along with this. So to get this humidity ratio, I just make a straight line, horizontal line to the right side, and I see where it intersects. Here's the humidity ratio scale, and we can see that it's, uh, it's about 0.005 but maybe a little bit above that, between each of the little horizontal is 0 .00, 0, 0, 0, 0.0002. So I read that as 0 .0051. Th this last digit is going to be a little bit uncertain. As a general rule, we use humidity ratio to the fourth decimal place. We really can't go past that. And this, this fourth one is going to be a little bit uncertain. But we certainly know this is going to be 0.005. It's just a little bit of uncertainty what that last number is going to be. And I think it's a 1. But we might vary depending on how we position our line. Um, now I want to, I, I'm going to get my magnifier here so I can see better um, for some of these other points. Um, let's look at wet bulb temperature. These numbers here are the wet bulb temperature. And the lines of constant wet bulb temperature, these little dashed little dots here. So this would be 35 degree wet bulb, 40 degree wet bulb. Where, where are we in our room? Well, each one of these is, this goes up by one degree. So 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 40, 39, 40, 40 is here. 41, 42, looks like we're around 42. And I carefully draw my line so I'm parallel to one of the wet bulb lines, and I get 42.2. That's, that's 42, 43. 42.1, 42.2 is what I'm calling it. Um, how about the dew point? The dew point is read by drawing a line from your, 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 your state horizontal to the left. So what you're doing here is you're cooling, you're cooling at constant moisture. Constant pressure cooling and constant moisture cooling until you hit saturation. And the temperature where you hit saturation is the dew point temperature right there. So there's my dew point temperature. Let's try to read what that is. Looks like it's about 39 degrees. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. Maybe a little more than, it's hard to tell. So you can see how, you know, this is kind of approximation, like reading the phase diagrams. Okay, so there's our dew point. Specific volume. Here's our lines of specific volume. So 30, 35, 40, 45. Whoops, I'm sorry, that's, I'm wrong. That's a, that's a wet bulb temperature. It's 12.5, 13. And these lines in between, so 12.5, 12.6, 12.7, 12.8, 12.9, 13. Where are we? Looks like about 12.8, 12.9, 12.8, what did I call it, 2? 12.82, yeah, so 12.85 would be in the middle. It's about 12.82. 
And then enthalpy, this is the, always the one that's the most challenging for me, is getting the enthalpy. Here's our enthalpy numbers up here, and we have to read these really fine, like a cone, these little lines here. So what I, you have to do to really do this accurately, well, as a, as a rule of thumb, the lines of constant enthalpy almost parallel the lines of constant wet bulb temperature, but not exactly. So what you can do is take a straight edge and connect the number up here with the number down here. So it's eight, 18 is up there, and then come down to 18 down here, 17, 16. So here's 15, and then 16, 17. And then, you know, you got your straight edge lined up like that, and then move it up or down until you get to your point of interest. So when I do that, so, well, each of these little lines here is an increment of 0.2. So this would be 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Then this would be 19.2. 19.4, 19.6, 19.8, 20. And then I, I, I do the alignment. 16.2 down here, and I get 16.2 up here. It, it, it takes a little jostling to get it right, but the enthalpy, 16.2. And we really can't go more precise than that, really. 16.2, 16.16.2. I guess you could say 16.22 or something like that, but as a rule of thumb, just one decimal place here is sufficient. Okay? So there we go. We have um, all the, it would have taken us 15 minutes to calculate this all out by hand, or at least 15 minutes of messing work with all those equations and tables. And we've got all these properties just using the psychometric chart. Okay? Now the remaining questions uh, ask us to, we're gonna, we're gonna air condition, we're gonna condition this air. And we're gonna do it in two steps. Actually the equipment would do it in one fell swoop, but we're gonna break it down into two parts. One is heating. We don't like 45 degree air, we like 72 degree air. So we're going to heat this air from 45 degrees to 72 degrees, and we're going to do it without messing with the humidity. So it's, we're going to have a straight horizontal line. This is sensible heating at constant moisture until we get to 72 degrees. Okay, so you're going to draw a line at 72, like that. We want to go to 72 degrees, and we don't want to change anything else. Well, other things are going to change, but we don't want to change the, the water vapor. The water vapor stays constant, so it's just a heating, pure heating, until we get to 72 degrees, and we want to know, what do we have? What's the humidity going to be? Relative humidity, 30%. So my relative humidity went from 80% to 30%, right? And I can figure out the enthalpy. We, we, we do exactly what we just did. Um, we get all of our properties at that state two. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, well, 30% is too dry. I dried out the air too much, so I want to add some moisture to it. I want to bring the humidity up to a comfortable level. What would be comfortable? 50% is something we shoot for. So let's humidify the air a little bit. And we're going to do that. Now we're gonna change the moisture, but hold the temperature constant. We're gonna take it up to 50% relative humidity. We call this latent heating. We're adding energy to the air, but not increasing the temperature. We're just increasing the moisture content. That takes energy, because we're adding, we're vaporizing moisture and putting that into the air. And so we're gonna go up until we're at 72 degrees and 50% relative humidity, a nice comfortable temperature. And now we're gonna count, we're gonna look at all of our properties at that point. And that's what we have. 
So we just did a, a process. We started out with really uncomfortable air. We heated it, and then we added some moisture to it to make it comfortable. And we're going to calculate, we do some calculations, how much energy we had to add to the air in order to, to bring it to this comfortable state. Okay, so that, that is the remain, uh, we're out of time, I can't do that part of the problem here. I will uh, try to post uh, this, make a video out of it. I started to make a video, I didn't have time, so that's what you, what you have. And I'll add the other parts of the problem to it um, and put it, post it on our site, so. Yeah.